Welcome to the Ben and Lauren Show. Here we are. <laughs> I'm Ben. This is Lauren. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's another Sunday night episode because we didn't do it Saturday night. I forget why. We were watching the Dustin Cassie show. That's why. Well, you were in another Bible project. Mm-hmm. And it was getting late. And then I saw that Dustin and Cassie were live. And so we watched that and procrastinated to the point where it was quarter after 12. And I said, I just can't do it. And so often that is the case. But here it is Sunday night. And we said, well, let's do it tonight. So then we sat down and we discussed an entire podcast worth of stuff without turning the camera on. So now i got to go back. And start <laughs> what is it we were talking about again? Well, we started back with last Sunday. Mm-hmm. Well, last Sunday we had... Uh, My sister and sister, brother-in-law visited. Yeah, and brother-in-law came by. We had a very good discussion. We did. I thought we did. And there were a lot of children. We have eight under the age of six between us. It was noisy. About to be nine under the age of six between us. It was a noisy evening. <laughs> you know, I don't really think either set of children is all that noisy by themselves. No. But if you put them together, it gets pretty loud. <laughs> we have one child multiplied times eight in a inside. It gets pretty noisy. I'm the oldest of eight children, and only one of the other children is married, and we already have eight between us. <laughs> so by the time my brothers and sisters get married, I think our family get-togethers are going to be epic. They are. <laughs> they really will be. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. <laughs> well, when my parents' grandchildren all come together, all the nieces and nephews, and... It's still the same number on both sides right now. It is. It's amazing. Ben's parents are thinking about um, renting a house in Florida um, for, I guess, I don't know how long. It's for, for some period of time, but the trouble is that houses where they want to rent one are so booked up that it sounds like they can't do it for two years. So planning ahead two years. So Ben's talking about wanting to plan ahead a family vacation, getting us together and his sister and them, and then going down and visiting his other sister in, in Florida. And uh, I'm like, my first reaction was, wow, that's going to be a lot of kids to organize. <laughs> and how many more children in two years? And then I said, Mom, you know, I think while you're looking at houses, you should plan on 12 children. She's like, well, how do you figure? Like, well, we're having one more now. Mm-hmm. We will probably have another one in two years. You know, and his sister and brother-in-law, are, we're, we're talking about another baby in the next little while. And we don't know about the other sister and brother, if you know. What they might decide, there's been some talk that they've thought before about a fourth, and I don't, we, we really don't know the family sizes, but if you're going to plan two years ahead, <laughs> you might want to plan on 12 children, and if we have less than that, we'll be fine. <laughs> okay, let's rent a cottage on the ocean and fill it up with 12 children and six adults. Well, it turns out that... Two, four, six, eight adults. Your sister Kim and I actually did have a similar thought. Kim, Eight adults and 12 children? Kim says she's not sure if it's a good idea for them to stay because their kids and our kids are on very different sleep schedules. And we were trying to imagine, you know, you take all of the kids out of their element and then try to get them to adjust to sleeping in some way. This does not sound like anybody's idea of a fun time. I think they go to bed like <laughs> right at 9 o'clock and then they get up at 6. Do they go to bed at 9 already? They used to go to bed like 6 o'clock in the evening. No, but I think not that early. Now. But they still get up very early. They get up very much earlier than ours. And ours tend to stay up later than theirs. So. Well, tonight they didn't get to bed till 11, right? And then we'll throw your other sister's little girl into the mix. Mm -hmm. And who knows what we're, like, again, we don't know what babies we're talking about. Babies, whenever you take them to a different spot, they always have weird. (laughs) Anyway, that's that's all a long discussion. So what else did we do this week? We had the. We had another interesting event on Friday. We invited um, Pastor Mark and Jill over for Shabbat dinner, and it was a very nice evening. I think it was. You met Pastor Mark 10 years ago. It was 10 years ago. And uh, I was baptized spring. Actually, it would have been summer of 2009. But, um, I mean, I could say I was saved in, two, in spring of 2009. That would be almost exactly 10 years to this time frame. Was it March or April? It was March. So, exactly March. 10 years. Yep. It was before Easter. I know that. That's and the amazing. weather was amazing that year. That It was just warm and sunny, and it was it was nice. I remember 2009, all that 
clearly. <laughs> I do. So 10 years, and a lot has happened since then, but the um, it was really pleasant. We really enjoyed their company, and they stayed pretty late, about maybe 9.30. 10. Yeah, we, we had a very nice... I w- would have been nice to keep talking. They had to go because they had to get up early. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't seen them in quite some time. Uh, I know Pastor Mark walked in the door and he looked around and there was four children running around. He said, <laughs> I thought you just had maybe three. <laughs> and we said, no, we have five. And he said, what do you mean five? <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, and five. <laughs> and he goes, did we know you were expecting? <laughs> <laughs> no. We actually made it Facebook official that very same day, Friday. I forget. It's really hard for me to keep track after having made so many new baby announcements. It feels like (laughs) recently I lose track of who has been told and who hasn't. And I feel a little badly about that. I feel very um, sloppy about it. I was told I haven't changed a bit. I got a beard now. I figured I changed a whole bunch. But I guess I... It was smiling. He recognized the smile. I'm not sure your beard changes you as much as you think it does. <laughs> <laughs> if I had no glasses on and no beard, no one would recognize me. Well, it's not like your beard is down to your belly button or anything like that. Well, like you have a big, can, giant, face-changing beard. I can, I can try that. See what happens. <laughs> you would look pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I ask my children, should I grow a beard down to here? And they say, no. I say, well, why not? Like, you wouldn't look like our daddy. <laughs> we wouldn't recognize you. Abigail says she wouldn't recognize him. So we had we had company on Friday. Mm-hmm. And then in between, it was a very intense week. It was. We had, um, we had to, <laughs> we tried one more time to put together a proposal. The guy we did the proposal for take home, for wanted he wanted a turnkey proposal but the problem is that what we do is long-term maintenance we were trying to scratching our head how on earth do we make this a turnkey proposal well you take out all the service aspects that are long ongoing and bundle it all into a one-year package and say boom here it is sign it sign at the bottom here and we sent the proposal in was it thursday mm-hmm Thursday? No, it was earlier than that. It It was was, it was either Tuesday. It was Wednesday morning, I think. Okay, so we sent it Wednesday, and we didn't get any response on Friday. So we'll see if we hear anything on Monday. Well, it kept taking us a week to get him something new. He's got at least a week to think it over. (laughs) Yeah, we're being a little slow in getting the information to him, so we're not going to be too anxious getting information back. Well. Part of it is it was very he's very cryptic in his emails and it was very difficult to figure out what it was that he was looking for and what was wrong with the proposal that we'd already given him. It was mm-hmm. very hard to understand what he was talking about. Right. So we did our best. Yep, well, well, we'll see. I don't know how long it takes before you hear no. That's okay. when you call him up and try to get a it's no not, out of him. If if it's a no. Move to the next lead. There will be another lead. Yep. The other opportunities. So then you and your dad went and looked at another opportunity. We did. And we got to meet a very interesting fellow. We were uh, He's in charge of a much larger water system that we're probably not quite ready for yet. But it was he might be a great opportunity for leads, good opportunity to learn from. And uh, he really likes conspiracies. <laughs> He was even a bigger conspiracy guy than you are. Yeah, we got there, and I'd say maybe about one-third of the time was talking about water systems, and then something came up, and the whole rest of the evening, the whole trip was talking about all sorts of whatever whatever <laughs> stuff. Was your dad cross-eyed by the end of it? <laughs> he said he's going to have a hard time sleeping at night, is what he told oh, me. Oh, dad was going to have a hard time sleeping at night? That's what he night? said, yeah. I hope not. I don't know if he was being, I don't think he was serious. <laughs> But, um, well, you and Jeff were probably egging the guy on. <laughs> well, me and Jeff were kind of like yeah, nodding their head like, yeah, yep, I heard that yep, one. Heard that one, familiar with yep. that one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I actually learned some things I didn't know. So I thought that was interesting. Stuff that happens that you don't necessarily hear about unless you hear it from other people. Was it repeatable stuff or is it stuff you're not going to repeat because it's too goofy? 
it's not goofy, but it's it's not it's just political stuff mostly. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, infringements on constitutional rights kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, that's mostly what we've talked about all week. We've been talking about that a lot. The infringement on constitutional rights and what on earth do you do about it when you see someone else's rights being infringed on and you know yours are probably next in line. What's amazing is that it's not really constitutional rights. It is unalienable rights. It is rights God endowed... Right, they're God-given rights endowed by our Creator. The right of a parent to decide what best to do for their child. Yeah. We've been watching the situation unfolding in New York still, and it's kind of making the hair on the back of our neck go up pretty badly because a county executive in New York has now quarantined all unvaccinated children in the Hasidic Jewish community of of, uh, Rockland Rockland County. Um, they are quarantined to their houses with pretty stiff penalties if they are found in public anywhere, including places of worship, including grocery stores, public parks, anywhere in public. If they leave their homes their fam- and they are caught, their family could be in big trouble. The thing is, these are healthy children. There has not yet been any cases of measles, it turns out, among the unvaccinated population of Rockland County. It's almost like legislative uh, shunning. Like society is supposed to shun them. That's exactly what it is. And what he did was he instituted a 30-day quarantine that extends over Passover. This would be very similar to someone in our county saying, any child who's not vaccinated may not go anywhere for the entire month of December. No Christmas for you unless you get vaccinated. And by the way, you must be vaccinated by the end of that time or we will prosecute the parents. It's just... So, whatever you believe on vaccination, that's actually against New York law. They have a they have a religious exemption, and these people are all complying with the law and are not sick. But yet. But it doesn't matter because the county executive doesn't like what they're doing, so he has he is enforcing that they stay in their homes. This guy also has a history of harassing the Hasidic community. It's disgusting. So he picked a doozy of a time. The whole thing's just, I was just telling Lauren, I mean, as awful as mass shootings are, they, they are, they are terrible, but they don't outrage me as much as things like this. This is more insidious and it's by people that you should be able to trust. You should be able to trust the executive of the government not to violate the law and to force you into a medical procedure that you are already following the law in your exemption for. So if you have a, a shooting event and somebody is armed, they can't stop the shooting event and save multiple lives. If you have an incident like this, now it's not the same as you know shooting a, a squirting a, a needle is not the same as shooting a gun. But well, there can be there could be repercussions from that. Well, what happens if the parents don't comply, and CPS takes their children? It could be years before they get their children back. The devastation from that is just unbelievable. They could lose their children. They could lose their children, or they could have to do something that they find morally reprehensible. I mean, if they've held out this long, there's been a lot of pressure on them for the last few months. I mean, their kids have already been barred from school for the past four months. And so far, like I said, it it appears that None of the cases that have been spread have been from unvaccinated people. And that's the ironic part. So they're basically being penalized for something they didn't do, something they don't have, and for following a law in their state. So here we are. And all of this over the measles. Over measles, yeah. Measles. So here we are, and we're not in the same situation they are. But we have other things that we do that officials don't necessarily like. And if these people are going to be put under this kind of pressure, it's like that old poem. You know, they came for my neighbor who was a bum, but I didn't say anything. I don't remember exactly how the poem goes, but it it basically ramps up where more and more people are taken, but the person who's writing the poem doesn't say anything because it wasn't me, and then they came for me. 
and there was no one left to say anything for me. Mm -hmm. So, whether you think the parents in Rockland County should be vaccinating their children or you don't think they should or whether you think you should do yours or you shouldn't, the infringement on the right of the Hasidic community in Rockland, New York is pretty severe. The ability for them to make medical decisions for themselves. And to parent their children. There's a reason why there's religious exemptions and medical exemptions. It's because ultimately it's the parents and the individuals who should be able to decide medical decisions for themselves. And even if you disagree with the decision a parent makes for their child, it is a strange parent that doesn't love their child dearly and strive to do what's best and to take that decision making out of their hands and assume you actually love that child more and know better. That violates something on a basic level that should not be touched. That's an inalienable right. Most parents are fit to make decisions for their children because they love their children very much and they're going to strive to do what's best for them. I often wonder if when people no longer believe in a creator, then they no longer believe in inalienable rights given by a creator. Well, we're seeing plenty of evidence from that everywhere. So the only rights you have are the ones that society deems you're worthy to have or is optimal for you to have. And those rights can be just as easily taken away if, for whatever practical reason, they feel it's necessary. Doesn't this play right into the whole situation that's going on in social media, though, where you're being told or people are getting kicked off of YouTube or Facebook or, or social media platforms because they don't hold the correct thoughts. Or just discouraged by demonetization. Or they're being discouraged. And then at first it was just kind of more fringe people who are kind of nutty, like Alex Jones, just being completely deplatformed. He can't say any of his thoughts on any of the major platforms. And people said, well, he's kind of, you know, kind of out there and kind of ridiculous, but it's ramping up. There are, there is person after person after person being cut off or threatened that if you don't carry, if you don't, if you don't speak the correct thoughts. Essentially, it's thought control. It's not mind control. They're not thinking for you, but it's thought control. They don't want you seeing certain movies. They don't want you seeing certain videos. They don't want you hearing certain podcasts. And it's because they know certain thoughts come as a result of of, think, of hearing these things or watching these things. And the people in charge of these platforms don't agree with those thoughts. So they, they don't agree with the thoughts. They should be banned. Even if they are factually accurate, even if they are uh, displaying accurate evidence for people right. to consider. Even if they're fairly dispassionate. like they, they're not, These are not people who are going out there and calling for the killing of an entire group of people, for instance, which but would it's, be sort of understandable. It's thought control. They, they don't want you thinking certain thoughts, but they do want you thinking other thoughts. They want you to, to question the president, just to be wondering, well, you know, he is under invested investigation. Oh, not anymore. He was cleared this week. Even now. <laughs> even now they're trying to, to raise suspicion. That those are the thoughts that are, that are approved by, mm -hmm. by the media. And those get that get broadcasted out to the world. The Young Turks gets broadcasted out, and funded, and encouraged. And there's certain movies that they encourage people to watch. And others. Oh yeah, everyone was supposed to go see Captain Marvel because Captain oh, yeah. Marvel was a girl. Like so. So there's this movie <laughs> that that most of the reviewers are not real fond of. Actually, the critics like it, but the actual moviegoers didn't like it. But yet it was so heavily promoted and it was just in your face and it was, it was, everybody had to go see it, whether you like it or not. And then there's another movie coming out that's being blacklisted. Unplanned, you mean? Unplanned, being blacklisted. Right, well that's the story of a Planned Parenthood, uh, basically a leader, a spokeswoman for Planned Parenthood participated in like, I think it was 22,000 abortions. I don't remember the whole story. I remember hearing bits of it, but I'm pretty sure what happens in the movie is that at some point she is a witness for an ultrasound guided abortion and she sees, I don't remember what she sees during 
what she saw during the abortion. I don't remember if she saw the baby die or she saw the baby reacting to what was being done to it. And it completely changed her view of what was happening. But this is a woman who is passionate about the right to kill the baby. Yeah, I actually don't know much about the movie. I just know it's being suppressed. Right. So that's what this movie is about. It's about her journey. It's about her story about what changed her mind and how she went from being the spokeswoman of Planned Parenthood to being an activist against it. And boy, oh boy, it's got, <coughs> it's got people mad. It does have people mad. They are not They are not being allowed to promote it. At one point this week, their Twitter account was suspended. Uh, the movie was rated R, even though it has no graphic uh, scenes in it. It's uh, probably to scare people away. It's to discourage church groups from going, because they'll be real slow to go see R-rated movies. I think they should go anyway. Well, I don't think that's going to work out. But anyway, a lot of stuff has been done to suppress that one. Go see Captain Marvel. Don't go see Unplanned. And one is a is a fiction fantasy movie and the other with a message that they approve of. I heard it was pretty pretty stupid movie, but <laughs> we're not fans of superhero movies. I mean Well, I used to really enjoy them. I we used to watch that replacement God's documentary. Oh, man. And it hit hard. It hit really hard. Yeah, if you if you wanna if you wanna know why we don't watch superhero movies Try looking up a documentary called The, the Replacement, Replacement Gods. Gods. That was pretty eye-opening to us about about superheroes in general. Yeah. But don't watch it unless you plan to not feel right about watching superhero <laughs> mu- movies in the it future. It will ruin <laughs> future superhero movies. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> From now um, on. Okay, so we were back at... Oh, we were talking about Thought Police... Yeah, they, it's a very fun subject. <laughs> I never quite looked at it that way, but that's really the only reason you want to suppress certain things and you know encourage people to watch other things. And it's also shocking when you look at all the violent movies, the horror films that are out there, those aren't suppressed. No, and you would think that that would be... That's, you that's would think awesome. you want to discourage that kind of thinking, but they... No problem with that. And I actually don't think that things should be encouraged or discouraged. It just should be, you know, free market. If people want to go see it, they should go see it. If they don't want to go see it. But it is kind of a pulse on the on the society to see what kind of movies people enjoy. Right. You know. So that was a lot. We, we spent a lot of time discussing that this week. We also spent a lot of time discussing how do we go about preserving our own beliefs and our own freedom. I mean, well, to a certain extent, it's up to God. Those freedoms come from God, and only He can preserve them. But we live in a country where where we were we were not permitted. That's not the right word. But there's been there's been a tolerance for allowing those rights to be unimpeded. Um, and what we're watching is rapidly, rapidly your rights are dwindling Mm -hmm. and uh, there's things that we know that we do outside the norm and pretty soon anything outside the norm is going to be penalized and restricted yeah and that's a sobering thought so cheerful thought for the week (laughs) what was the uh, what did jesus say about that Um, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves yes when it comes to protecting your families that's really what you have to do you have to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Yep. So we do our best. That's a good segue into the Torah portion. Because of the doves? <laughs> <laughs> because of the doves. <laughs> See, we're laughing because this Torah portion is about uh, continuing in Leviticus about sacrifices, specifically about uh, you know sacrificing doves in well, certain instances. Yeah, this is always a weird chapter. Our weird, weird Torah portion, because it's basically about talking about the laws of uncleanliness after childbirth and the laws of uncleanliness concerning uh, leprosy. Leprosy. Yeah, we learned a lot about leprosy. So it was talking about uh, how women are unclean for a period of time after giving child, having childbirth. And uh, I did the math. You've been unclean for 300 days. Well, that's just after having babies. After babies. <laughs> that's just for babies. No, what what it will it will be three hundred at least after this baby. 
Nope, it's 300 already, and it oh. will be 300 and... A whole year, wow. Yeah. 380? It's going to be 360 or 360. No, 360, 360 or 380. Or 380. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 60 days of, of being unclean if you're... If you've just had a boy, and 80 if you've just had a girl. And being unclean is not a sin. It's not a bad thing. It just is. It's simply a state of being. It just is. It, it, mean, it would mean that, basically, in that time, that I would be more uh, restricted a little bit. Because you, you really can't go out in public, because other people need to be kept clean if they are going to be involved in things that, right. you know, at the tabernacle or whatever. Um. But then there's also... You couldn't go to the tabernacle for any gatherings. Right. But then there's also the uncleanliness that comes from a skin disease that could be leprosy. And we were reading about all the different ways of detecting that the priest would actually detect leprosy. And it included not only skin, it also included uh, burns uh, to inspect it to see if it's leprous. It also included uh, garments of clothing or leather. Um, houses. Houses. So it's it's leprosy is more than just a skin disease. It's almost like a, a gets on anything. I'm not sure that leprosy of that time was what we would recognize as leprosy today, because especially when they were talking about the garments and mm-hmm. the houses, that sounded to me like in the houses like a black mold infestation almost. almost. Same thing on the leather or on the linen or the cotton. It was a sickness that you were to get rid of. And it's interesting, what kept coming to mind, actually, when I was listening to this, was how God told his people, if you listen to me and you follow my instructions, you won't suffer the diseases of the Egyptians. Yep. And we know now that the Egyptians pretty much suffered all the diseases that we suffer today. I mean, they even suffered cocaine addiction, it turns <laughs> out, and smallpox, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, if they followed God's law, though, if God's people followed his laws, and I, I, I honestly, I think there's a spiritual element to all the things oh, God yeah. said. I don't think it was just physical. No. But if they followed his instructions, he was going to preserve them from a lot of things. We, we were talking about the plague in in Europe that killed so many people. The Jews were looked on very suspiciously at the time because they did not get sick like the rest of the population. I mean, they had their cases, but very few people got sick. It's because they recognized clean and unclean. And what would happen was... In God's law, he says, if a, if a mouse falls into an, an item of food, like a, like, a, like a dish of food, you're to get rid of everything, including the dish. Um, that being the case, the people at the time were really scrupulous about keeping the rodents out of their houses. That was one of the things they did. And other people of their, of their class did not do that, and they got the fleas from the rodents. They did. That's they would where, get sick. That's where bubonic plague comes from. So there was no witchcraft about it. They followed God's instruction to the best of their ability, and they were saved from this disease. Right. Clean and unclean. <laughs> That's really what the Torah portion was about. And it's sometimes easy to forget about clean and unclean. Well, we go through these laws, and it can make your eyes cross after a while. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to relate to anything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we have sort of a science-based medical idea of certain things. Um, I thought it was interesting. It's almost as if the priest was like a modern-day doctor. Uh, there's a lot of similarities because doctors will basically declare you sick or healthy, just like a priest would declare you clean or unclean. You know, do you have leprosy or do you not? You know, And I think leprosy means something different than than we think of it meaning now. I'm not sure exactly. they were the same as doctors, though, because they didn't prescribe anything to cure it. They were just there to identify it. Almost like detectives. Or, or just witnesses. Witnesses. So, it's interesting, though, that God only says to do that for leprosy. Mm-hmm. He, didn't, he didn't have people coming in to be inspected by the priest for other illnesses. So that particular illness that's been surmised for some time must have some type of spiritual connection. If if God made such a big deal about, you know, there being so much sacrifice and and ritual inspection involved. Well, we remember that uh, Miriam received leprosy after speaking out against Moses and Aaron, 
So there's a connection between your words and the skin disease leprosy. That's that's one inference that's drawn. And who knows if that's but, if that is the direct connection, but that's. I find one it of the peculiar thoughts. that really the only disease that God talks about having anything to do with the priest inspecting is leprosy. Yeah. Just for some reason. But then that could be any. I mean, chicken pox would be considered leprosy. You test, you know, you have these lesions. And you have to see if it's skin deep, you know, or smallpox or. They didn't prescribe any any curative things for them. No, they just, just looked at them. And they quarantined them, essentially. Well, I guess they did quarantine them. They quarantined them. And there was a period of time that the priest would inspect them again. And if they were gone, he would declare them clean. And they would wash and be clean. Or they would be back in quarantine again. Well, well let's think about this. Let's say some family in Nazareth gets chicken pox. Mm-hmm. What was it, a three-day walk to Jerusalem? Yeah. Do you pack up the sick kids and you take them all to Jerusalem Pretty so they can much. get looked at? I mean, if they're little kids, they might actually be better by the time you got there. Are you sure that they really did that? Or did they just wait to see if the sores hung around? I think it actually had to wait. I mean, it had to be there for a period of time. If it didn't go away, that's when you I mean, got the inspection. you're a teenager, you get pimples. Are you going to go to trek down to Jerusalem and have every single one of them checked out every time? Well, uh, doctors probably put up with that a lot. I mean, doctors assume, until they can verify for themselves, the doctors assume you don't know what you're talking about. True, but I don't think that doctors today have to deal with someone who has to take a three-day walk to come and see them. And by the way, most pimples are healed up in that time, too. That's true. No one would ever get anything done. No, that's true. Well, it was never more than a few day journey from pretty much anywhere in Israel. Still, you're talking about a teenager. So every time a teenager gets a really bad pimple, they've got to go see the priest. No, no. If it doesn't I, go I'm away, I'm sure there was a little bit more leeway than if, every. No, I think it's infected, and if it starts, you know, probably if it has a uh, white head, that goes away in a day. It does, but anyway, whatever <laughs> the case. There's a difference between a boil and a pimple. Right. That is true. So if you have a boil, it's not going to go away as quickly as a pimple does. It does take a couple of weeks usually. So. Really clear up. So that was the the tour portion this week. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that was it. <laughs> yeah, I was asked to talk about it at our our Bible study, and it's like, well, it's about leprosy. What did we talk about? So we did. We talked about leprosy. We talked about, you know, remember the. Yeshua was a healer of the lepers. Yes. And go see a priest according to Moses' commandments. Mm-hmm. I think that was actually a message to the priests that Messiah was here because they were seeing lepers come in who were who were cured. I don't think that really ever happened. No, that was unusual. It, it, there was some talk that Naaman may have been one of the only people to be known to have been cured from leprosy. Which is probably why that's an interesting story makes that notable. He was also a Gentile. Yeah, he wasn't an Israelite. Pagan Gentile. <laughs> wasn't even a God-fearing Gentile. Well, I think he might have been after that experience. Uh, apparently he was. Yeah, he was toting dirt back to <laughs> <laughs> so he could worship God on proper Hebrew soil. <laughs> That's right, Israel soil. <laughs> so that concludes, I think that concludes our Ben and Lauren show tonight. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of other odds and ends we could mention, but I do see that we were over half an hour now. We always go at least over a half hour these days. Well, there was only one important event I wanted to mention. Okay. Did feel the baby move the first time this ah, week. Yeah, that's right. That's always very exciting. At how many weeks? Eleven and a half. Eleven and it's a half earlier weeks. each time. So this must be a big baby. I can't tell if the baby is bigger or I just know what I'm feeling sooner. <laughs> that's pretty cool. It feels strong. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll be able to feel the baby at 11 and a half weeks. Well, it's past that point. No, 12 we'll be weeks. At 12 weeks tomorrow. Okay, 12 weeks. Now. So we are out of the first trimester, which means I should start feeling better. I always, I always start feeling better just about the time I can start feeling the baby moving, and that's very reassuring to me because as long as I'm feeling rotten, I think I know that everything's doing pretty well. So when I start feeling better, that would be a little bit disconcerting to me if I wasn't also starting to feel the baby moving. So I know the baby's fine. <laughs> so you're feeling the baby moving. Now it's time to start feeling better. Yes. It's it's time to start feeling better. 
<laughs> this, this trimester was a little rougher than usual. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I see you have more energy. I mean, energy's starting to come back. Yeah, I just, I, I do have a little more. So. All right, so I'm going to, we're going to leave that at that and say goodnight, Lauren. Do you want me to be literal or to say goodnight properly? You always say goodnight, Lauren. Okay. Good night, Lauren. Aww. Bye, everyone.